Hi everyone. My name is Michael Stipes. Um, I'm one of the 11 members of the GraphQL steer Technical Steering Committee of the GraphQL Foundation. And I'm also the author of the Hot Chocolate GraphQL Library in .NET. Today we are going to take a trip and explore how we can build modern applications with GraphQL. So what does modern applications mean? Uh, for me, it means that applications are reactive and responsive. Have strong contracts with your backend. And you have things like, like compile time safety. Before we get into it, let's quickly do a mini quiz to find out where the crowd is with GraphQL. It's just two questions. Swipe over. Okay, awesome. Okay. So, first question. Have you used GraphQL before? Maybe you don't know it. Maybe you heard about it. Okay, some already have it in production. Good. But a lot of you just heard about it. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. The second thing. How old do you think is GraphQL? Okay, so the most of you think five years. Two thousand twelve was the first version of GraphQL, and uh, Nick Schrock from Facebook actually named it SuperGraph for lack of a better name. So it was in March two thousand twelve. So it's ten years old. Many people don't realize that, and uh, there is an often made mistake because people think most people think it's five years old. Because in 2015, seven years actually, was when Lee Byron, Nick Schrock, and Dan Schaffner uh, were in the React conference, I think in Europe, and talked about the concept of GraphQL. And 2016 was the date, the year when they released the first version of GraphQL as an open source specification. So there's actually no GraphQL library from Facebook there, so no official GraphQL library from the GraphQL Foundation there. GraphQL is just an open source specification. So what is GraphQL? And this is a super quick introduction I will do because I have so much to show in demos and code, which is nicer than just talk about GraphQL. So before we answer the que question what GraphQL is, let's explore why Facebook introduced GraphQL. So back in 2011, 2012, Facebook started building mobile applications. Before they just built web applications that you consumed on the browser. But with the iPhone getting a lot of market share, they were forced into the mobile um, App business. But when people started using their application, they were quite upset because the first Facebook applications were really, really slow. And they used a lot of data. And back then, if you remember, 
data was precious. We had maybe 500 MB of data plans and yeah, the Facebook apps maybe run through it in a couple of days. Also, the applications use a lot of battery. Your phone would get really, really hot and people weren't happy. There were also discussions that Facebook might not survive the mobile age. They did. So what happened? Facebook used their standard technologies like REST and HTML to build mobile applications. And the team at Facebook, these three developers I just uh, said, Lee Byron, Dan Schaffner, and Nick Schrock, they looked at why the applications perform so badly. What they found out is that they exactly do what they did on the desktop. And that was using REST and HTML. And the problem with REST is the isolation that we have. REST is about resources. And we want to isolate our resources. Like maybe we have a me endpoint that deals with the currently signed in user. And when I call it, I get the currently signed in user. But I get all the things that the backend engineer thinks are good for me. And then if I need other things that are connected to this user, I do need to call another resource, maybe the news resource. And in this, I must pass maybe an ID that, is my, that comes from my previous request. And then again, I have to consume what the server developer thinks is good for me, even though it was designed for a desktop. And we can imagine that there might be another endpoint, like a comments endpoint, where I get the comments for each news. So I'm calling this. And what happens with such an architecture is that my call graph looks something like this. And we call that cascading requests, like requests that depend on previous requests. And we cannot parallelize these. That means the telephone or the, my mobile phone takes a long time to open this application because we have to get all these data and I'm blocked until I have all of these. So let's have a look at how GraphQL tackles this very problem. In GraphQL, we reverse the concept. Not the server developer tells me what I can do. It's essentially the consumer of an, uh, so the developer of the front end that can specify what data he or she needs. In this case, we are asking for the currently signed in user and just for the name. And if we send that to our GraphQL server, we just get that. And if you look at that, it looks like I'm sending in an empty JSON graph to my backend and the backend just fills it up. It's not like that, but it's a good mental pictures to start thinking about it. And as my use cases change, or I need for a component more or less data, I can just drill in ask for more data, for instance, for the profile picture. And again, as I send that in, my GraphQL server will just respond in a, in, with a response that closely aligns my request. And if I look at that, I can see it's not about flat sparse fields. It's actually about data trees. And this is awesome when I have related objects, like maybe the friends or the news stories or whatever. I can just drill in and ask for the data. But we can already see that we have some repetition here, like name and last scene, na like the me field returns a user and friends returns a list of users. And I'm using in both the same fields. In GraphQL, there's a concept that we call a fragment. And a fragment in GraphQL is our primitive for composition. I can build fragment hierarchies as I build component hierarchies. And we see what that means in one of my demos. Just put it on your brain stack. So GraphQL empowers the developer that builds the front end or that consumes the data and not the back end developer that thinks 
in a certain use case that might be already outdated again. So what is GraphQL? If you look up the GraphQL org um, description, it will say that it's a query language for your API. It's not a query language for your database or something like this. It's a query language for your API. And it's a runtime to fulfill your queries. So it's not like just like a schema in, in Swagger or so. It's really enforced. We have a full type system, like in C Sharp. With GraphQL, we only have one endpoint, not like REST, where we have multiple resources that are re represented by endpoints. We have a single one. Because we essentially tell the GraphQL so what data we need. So we just need one endpoint to post our request to. And we can ask for all the data that we need in one request. And this means we don't have over or under fetching. And over or under fetching is essentially like when I get this first request, me, and I just needed actually the user ID from that. That is overfetching because I get all the information that I don't need. I just need the ID to get actually some other data. And it's also underfetching because I don't want actually the ID. I, was this, I want this other data. As I said, GraphQL is built on a strong type system. And that means it's not like in Swagger where I can say, okay, this is my schema, but I still send you something else. The GraphQL server will protect you from invalid data. And that makes GraphQL predictable to use. And it's also real time. That's one too early. Let's have a look how GraphQL feels. Because we are thinking in code. So let's have a look how we can build a GraphQL server. So if you want to get started with GraphQL, the simplest way is to install the hot chocolate templates. We're using the newest shit. So we're going for the preview here. Um, and you just do dot and new dash i and hot chocolate templates, and then you have our templates. So let's just create a new GraphQL server. .NET, actually new GraphQL. And let's have a look at it. Okay. So let's first look at the program CS. And this is a new minimal API that you know from um, .NET 6. Let me just restore it. So what we can see, we have the standard web builder that we have with REST. And then we have this here. We are adding a GraphQL server to our services. Because GraphQL is transport agnostic, we can host our GraphQL server as a service. And in this instance, we are adding a query type. What a query type is, I explain you in a second. The second important thing is here, the map GraphQL. That's our ASP.NET Core middleware that implements all the transport uh, specifications for GraphQL. So it's essentially three lines of code and I have my GraphQL server running. So how does this query type actually look like? It's simple C sharp. So I can just create a class query here and expose fields that my user can then query. In this instance, get book. Let's see how that feels in GraphQL. Oh no. That's something new. With Mac, you always have to. Okay. So let's go on our endpoint. And the default endpoint is always hosted on the GraphQL route. And we get this little, new, uh, this, this little GraphQL IDE here. It's also built by our project. It's called Banana Cake Pop. And the hot chocolate is the backend, and banana cake pop is our GraphQL IDE. Okay. So I'm opening a new document here, 
and I'm connecting to the GraphQL server. And the first thing I want to do is actually explore my schema. So I can go on the schema reference tab here. And that is unexpected. Ah, there. Okay. There was something in my cache, maybe. Okay. So I'm on my schema reference tab here, and I already can see there's a query type. And the query type has a field book. We actually apply on the C sharp type some GraphQL best practices. We wouldn't say get book, we would say book or book by ID. So we are removing the verbs and things like async and stuff like that. Okay, so I already have my query type here and I can drill in. So I can call this field book. I can drill in and I can see the book actually has a field title and has a field author. And if I drill in further, I can see my author has a name. Let's query our GraphQL server. So in GraphQL, we would start with the keyword query to query our endpoint. And that means I'm actually using this query type and I'm just reading data. And then I can just drill in the API that I have here. I'm asking for book and maybe I'm just asking for the title of book and let's just run that and then I just get the book. And if I want more, for instance, the author, then I'm just drilling in and then I get everything. Let's reflect on that. Let's go back into our server. So actually what I have to do in .NET is just expose my business model to my GraphQL server and I'm able to query it. That's actually also how Facebook built the GraphQL server. GraphQL is just a thin layer over the business layer. It doesn't have anything to do with graph databases or databases. And GraphQL is the query language for your API. So you're exposing your business model and GraphQL gives you all these capabilities to expose it in a much richer way. Like you have interfaces, you have unions, you have enums. So you don't have to copy to DTOs anymore. You just let people drill into your graph. Okay. Let's move to a more complex demo. That's just how to get started. It's actually now simpler than building a REST service because you can just expose your models the way you like. Okay. At this point, the first question is, how do I handle databases? I maybe have an entity framework, DB context. How can I expose that? That's quite simple. Let's go in here. In this demo, I have a very simple uh, DB context. It's called asset context. And I'm exposing assets. These are cryptocurrencies, uh, essentially, and asset prices, two models. And they are connected. So I can query into assets, and from assets, I can get to the price. In order to query that, I need a root type. And that's what the query type actually is. So let's create our query root type here. Query dot cs and let's add some base structure here so it's a simple class query and then i need something that we call a resolver to query that in this instance i'm saying my resolver is called get assets and i'm injecting into my resolver the asset context that's my db context and i'm just returning essentially the DB set here as a queryable. And that lets me query into my assets. Okay, let's go into the program CS. So we have to declare again our query root type. Let's just add it here. And the second thing is, because I have not annotated my DB context as a service or so, uh, because I don't want to use a lot of attributes, so I can also do that um, like here centrally. I can say, okay, the DB context is something special. 
it's actually an asset DB context. And uh, then I also can tell my GraphQL engine how to use that. I essentially can say this is a pooled DB context, so it's rented. Rented when you need it and then give it back so we save a lot of precious memory. And then I can just run that. Let's go back to our GraphQL ID, refresh the schema, I can see, okay, the schema is not anymore valid, uh, valid because now I have here assets and I can see that I have a list of assets that I'm returning and if I drill into that, I can see all the properties I want to expose and I can drill into asset price, can see that it also has some properties and from there I could potentially query the asset again, so in circles. Um, okay, let's query that. So we can just maybe get the name, query for that, and I'll get the data. But I actually get all the data, which is not good. And um, I would need to implement some paging here. So in GraphQL, we actually have a special sort of paging. Let me just go back to the slides which we call cursor-based pagination. Let's go here. So typically when you do REST, um, or most people do, um, something that is called an offset pagination. And uh, when Facebook started with uh, GraphQL, they built a, s built a lot of patterns around it. So the problem with offset pagination is, think about, we have this set of items. Let's say these are IDs of my items. And when we page through that, we would do a skip take, right? But when there's new data coming in, like the new stories, it can happen that you page and then have the same items again. Because when we insert new data, the pages actually shift. And what Facebook came up is, uh, with was something called a cursor-based pagination. And we are doing with the entity framework a lot of work to make this plug and play in hot chocolate. Because cursor-based pagination actually pins the IDs. So a page is you navigate relatively to a specific entity. So instead of saying skip take, we would say um, after ID five, take five. And this way you don't have the jumps and your pages actually shift as new data comes in. Okay, let's let's put that in and see how we can build such a paging into our API. As I said, we did a lot of work with the entity framework team to make it easy. So the thing we have to do is say use paging. So use paging, and then you can say .NET run. Ah, that's .NET in the run. Okay, let's go back to our thingy here. And now we refresh, we can see it's actually invalid because our schema has changed. Because we now have a new type that is called asset connection. So we can it's essentially a paging type where we now have nodes, a page info and an asset uh, and an asset edge. And that means the nodes are actually my entities where I can query for the name, for instance. And then I have this page info where I have indicators on which page I am. Is there a next page? What is the end cursor? And if I would wanted to implement a simple fast forward paging, I could say, has next page? Is there something next? And what is the end cursor? And then I could query my data set and you can already see, I just get 10 items here. That's the default paging size. And I can now take this cursor that I have here and pass into my field. So in GraphQL, fields are actually methods, are functions. And so I can pass arguments in here 
And I can say, give me the next 10 items. I can also specify that I want the next, let's say, give me nec the, the first items, the first five items after this last item. And we can just go up here and we are paging. And this is a much um, more sophisticated version of paging. And you actually have not to do a lot of things. You just annotate. And if we go and see, we translate it correctly. So by default, we emulate it to this skip and take, which actually is not good. But you can also configure it that we use like proper indexing properties. Okay. So we are rewriting actually on top of our query will here with expression so that it's translated to proper SQL. So how does it work? So Hot Chocolate has this concept of field middlewares. So when I annotate there, and we also have a Fluent API, I'm just showing here the, the annotation-based annotation approach. There's also a Fluent API, actually, where you don't have to annotate. And there's also an approach called Schema First. So for people that don't like attributes, there's a way out. So, but this at attribute in this instance is actually a field middleware. And when we annotate that on our field, we actually wrap a middleware around it, like an ASP.NET Core. And what this does is essentially, it's a pipeline. The use pagination middleware will just uh, initially invoke next. And then the resolver, the get assets, will be invoked and uh, returns actually a queryable which the use paging middleware takes and applies slicing on top of it. But we actually can do more. Let's go back to our middle, to our code. We can also expose other things like maybe we want to query a bit more so we can say use um, sorting or use filtering or use projections so we can drill into our data. Let me just, these are data middleware, so I have to register them that they are uh, allowed on my schema. So I say add sorting, dot add filtering, dot add projections. And with that, I cannot really drill into my data. Let's refresh that. And now I have more arguments actually here because I can maybe look for things. Let's um, say where. Where the price And in the price object, the last price is greater than two. And I could also order it. It's, it's a bit like, um, so we translated that. That's not GraphQL standard, right? Uh, GraphQL actually doesn't specify how your structure looks like. So what we did, we took a bit uh, a Mongo approach here. So it kind of looks like a Mongo query, not exactly. Um, and now, let me get rid of this because maybe this item is not long, no longer there. We're taking five items that actually have a price higher than two. And now we are executing that query. And we can see that now the query is rewritten to only select the name because we only are querying for the name now and to um, whether last price is greater than P0 and we limit it to the first five. But we can do more. We can also drill into our data. Like let's get the latest price.
It's a pity. It's null. Strange. Okay. That's a bug in my demo. Use filtering, assets. Ah, yes. Okay. Because we are projecting assets. But do we have this correctly here? No, I think this has to be a settable thing. Okay. I'm not the expert in entity framework, by the way. Let's retry that. Yeah, now it's must be settable. Didn't know that. Okay, so now we can project into it and uh, we generate proper expressions on top of that. And you can see that also the SQL changed, like we are now drilling in from the SQL side. This works not only with entity framework, so I'm actually more in the Mongo side of things. So it, was, it works also with Mongo, we are working on Elastic and other things. But I said it's in the beginning, GraphQL is actually not a query language, it is not. It's meant for APIs and you can come with your domain driven design and also plug it in and we will tr understand that. It's just if you have these little projects or this is your approach you want to do, you can do that. Just plug it in, we understand you. Okay, let's just go back into the slides. And that is the full pipeline that we actually have and you can see we are essentially uh, pipelining it, we get the query bill, we, we are rewriting the query bill and if it's Mongo, we are not using a query bill, we are actually rewriting Bison objects. Because uh, we are really using the native uh, Mongo driver then and not the query bill approach. You can use it with query bill, but the Bison objects are much faster. Yeah, and that's just an example. You have a, uh, you have a graph like that and we essentially rewrite it if you choose to do that. But GraphQL is not great just for things like that, plugging in your domain-driven uh, object structure or your um, data sources like your DB context. It's actually great with any DB, uh, with any source. So in the beginning when GraphQL became available to the JavaScript community, they tried to convince the backend developers to start working with GraphQL and uh, the backend developers were a bit reserved. So what they did is they take a GraphQL server and just um, bind it on their REST endpoints and made their own GraphQL server with the REST endpoints of their backend engineers. So typically what we saw here was actually how Facebook started, putting a thin layer of GraphQL over your business layer or about your, uh, over your data layer, however you want to do it. But what they did essentially is putting it over REST, over gRPC or whatsoever. Like Twitter uses GraphQL and they have it over their Thrift microservices. Let's have a look how we can do that. So let me go in my next demo. It's demo three. Okay. So this is the same service, but in a different development stage. So uh, we also have the assets, but we want to combine that with data from our REST endpoint. So more concretely, we have, let me get Postman. Okay. No, it's not that. It's actually this guy. Okay, actually we want to have a price service that gives me the quotes over the day. Like, I want to see if maybe the BTC, um, uh, the, the Bitcoin, change uh, how much it changed in a month or how much it changed in a day. So I have an aggregation service somewhere. And I want to take this service and merge that into my price type. How would I do that? Actually, it's super simple. And we're taking now a different approach. So we have 
used annotation based so far and we actually can mix the approaches you can mix fluent types and uh, schema first and uh, annotation based all together however you want so we're going here in our types and I'm adding a new thing which we call asset price change dot graphql and that is a graphql type specification and what I'm doing there is I'm saying okay there's a type asset price change that is a type in my rest service which doesn't have a typing and then I'm saying there's a percentage change field which is a float and can never be null and that comes from a JSON and then I'm going to my configuration here and I'm adding my let's, let me do that I'm adding this file as a GraphQL document and um, now my system actually understands that JSON object I added here the HTTP client which is configured to fetch from that REST service that we saw and I'm just going now to my price node which is a price object and it's actually not my price entity I'm uh, saying okay I have a, the asset price object I'm extending it with fields that are not on my business model so all these methods here are new methods that I'm adding to that initial object. So I'm adding here a method called get, get change. And what it does, it, it says it returns an asset price. It's a JSON element, just really the raw JSON data from my REST service. Um, and I'm using a data loader here. A data loader is a concept that will batch requests because I'm fetching a list of data from my database I would need to fetch for each of these items some data from the rest service which would be not so performant so I'm using a data loader here it's a concept in GraphQL we use very often to batch these requests in one go to my backend so just a few lines of code and mm, essentially just a typing and we can go back here to our service actually let me get rid of this guy here yes why did it die <laughs> okay could not find file okay where should it be? Assets, types, assets, demo three. Should be there. I would say it's there. Okay. I maybe messed up the, f uh, the pass here, so I can also just take the string. Let me just fix it. Add document from string. I don't want to look for wrong okay that should also work yeah the thing is I created this talk this morning so I never run these demos okay let's write let's refresh that ah okay I just so I'm using this um, from JSON directive here. That's a, that's a pipelining directive. And I needed to register it first. So I say add JSON support. And now my GraphQL system will understand JSON. And now it should work. OK. So now we refresh that. It works. And uh, we can now drill into our data structure here. So we can see query. I can get the assets. I can get into the asset. I have the price. And you can see I have the price change here. And let's just query that. So we want the change and we want from our REST service um, 
the the change for each item over the day aggregated and let's take the percentage change and get rid of these guys here execute that okay took a bit long on the first time okay now you can see it's 104 milliseconds although it goes to an azure function to fetch the data there um and that's because we are batching the data. You can see here's the database calls, also batched. And then it takes the, here, here's the HTTP call. Let's just copy it out. You can see we are batching the requests to this REST service. And then we get for each item in our list in one go the data from the REST endpoint. So it's very easy to combine like different data sources, like gRPC, like REST, like what, what have you. We just combine it in GraphQL. Why should we do that? Because GraphQL is kind of the compensation of our microservices. Like um, with microservices REST, it was actually very difficult to know where to get which data. But now with GraphQL, we have this one endpoint where we can drill into all this data and connect it. Like I'm... I'm not going with my front end now to this the, to this back end and aggregate the data in my front end. I let the back end aggregate the data and just send the data down to my front end that I really uh, that I really need and avoid overfetching, uh, underfetching, and also latency issues. Right? Okay. Let's go to the to the next demo. Oh, let's let me first go back to the slides because now comes the really new stuff to GraphQL. <sighs> okay. Okay, that's not new. Real time data. Um, let's quickly go into that. So, I said in the beginning that GraphQL is also real time, meaning we have. GraphQL queries, and all we did were GraphQL queries so far, but we also have mutation, mutations, changing data, and we have real-time data, which is changing events. So the queries is essentially your get in REST, whereas the mutation is a put, post, patch, delete in REST. And events doesn't exist in REST. Uh, I mean, you can have additional concepts, uh, web sockets or so on, but in GraphQL, it's integrated. I can define my queries like I did for just a simple query as a real-time query. How does it work? In GraphQL, we, um, we, uh, with a subscription, we instead of a single result, get a stream of results. We call that the response stream. And subscriptions, as you might expect, don't work over HTTP. They can work over several things like server-side events, like um, uh, webs, web sockets, which most subscriptions use, or other transport uh, components that support multiple updates. gRPC would also be a transport possibility. And uh, what is important here is that we have a concept of events. When an event happens, we will execute a query. So for each raised event, we will produce a response. So and that works with the event stream. We essentially will subscribe to an event stream that uh, will trigger every now and then. It can be external, it can be internal. Um, and essentially for each triggering of our event, we will execute a query and send down the response for that query to the client. Okay. Let's quickly get into that. Demo F4. CI. Okay. So, so far we just used a query type. This time we will create a subscription type. So let's go to our assets here. And I already created the file, asset subscriptions. And we are just adding a simple type as we did for our query. And also a simple resolver we call on price change. 
And this resolver actually will be called when the price, uh, when, uh, when the event will be triggered. And we get an event message here, which is a symbol to our cryptocurrency. And then we will use a data loader here to fetch the data for the symbol and return the asset price to the user. But we still need something. How do we listen to an event stream? And that is done with async um, enumerables, or you can also take observables, but typically you want a stream. So we are going to create a price change stream here, and we are listening to an internal service, it's our price change service that produces events whenever uh, a new price for a symbol for an asset for cryptocurrency occurs. And we just yield for each event the symbol and that will actually trigger our resolver because we are going to tell our resolver that it shall, shall be using this event stream. Okay. And with this, we are actually ready to be using subscriptions. We just added the type here. Um, what I already did is put an in-memory subscription provider in. Typically in a production system, you would use something else, a real pub sub system like Redis um, or Kafka or what, what have you. Um, so I just put an in-memory here, which is based on the channels API of Microsoft. And I also configured here to use WebSockets as a transport. Okay, just quickly check. Yeah, I should add everything really in. Don't have to run. Okay, so the thing is coming up. I'm emulating real time. So that's why you can see a lot of thing going on here. We actually are pulling from an online service in new prices and updating then internally. Okay, so instead of writing the query keyword here, we write subscription. And um, let me just refresh the schema. So subscription, and then we can see here our on price change event. So I can just go in there and then I can drill into the fields like with the query. I can say, give me the latest price for the symbol. I could also drill into the whole graph here and send me this data down whenever something changes and I subscribe to and I get all the price updates immediately. So it's as simple as writing the query, you get real-time data. And this is really awesome when you think about the applications and I will show in a minute a proper React application where you can see how this is actually used. Okay. Go back to the slides. So as with always with real-time data, there are always problems. A lot of them are fixed with the GraphQL transport protocols. Like for instance, what if we are multi uh, multiple times subscribing to our system? A single user uh, goes for multiple um, subscriptions. The GraphQL protocols we have implemented and that are also standardized in the HT, uh, GraphQL over HTTP specification support multiplexing. You just uh, do one WebSocket connection and subscribe on this sim a single connection to multiple subscriptions. But the real problem, so where you have to think about is scaling. Like we have a WebSocket connection means with um, uh, with a cluster, you have to think about uh, how you scale that properly. There are solutions for that, but you have to think about that. Also, throttling or quality of service is something you have to think a bit mo more. But um, let's head further because time is short. Let's go in some new concepts. This is something that is uh, at the moment proposed in the GraphQL spec and will come in the next GraphQL specification. It's called the defer directive. And it's actually one of two, defer and stream we are talking about. And what it allows us is to, over a simple query, we can deprioritize data. We can essentially tell our system what data is important to us and what we need now, because with GraphQL, we want to fetch all the data that we can in j 
just one request. But that can mean if we are querying for slow data, that we actually have to wait longer for our data. And that's where defer comes in. Because with defer, I can say, for instance, that the asset name is important to me, so I can render quickly my components. Uh, but the price, for instance, can be coming a bit later because maybe we are getting it from a different service. So we deprioritize this data. Typically in a client application, we would use a proper fragment like we saw in the beginning and then defer that. Okay, defer works in the execution engine that the executor will split our, uh, our graph apart execute first the initial graph, wait until we have sent down the first response, and then process the deferred parts. And this works over HTTP 1. So you can use it in any browser. Let's go into it quickly. That's my last demo, and we are very tight on time. Demo 5. Okay, let's take the server. Uh, okay, let me just show you how that actually works. Dot and run. Okay, so my server is coming up. I'm refreshing my schema here. And I think I already prepared something for the defer case. Come on. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, there. No. Okay, I did that. So this is a defer. Uh, this is my uh, query that I want to do. And actually, when I execute it, it will be around 500 milliseconds, 600 milliseconds, which is kind of slow for my web application. So I know that name is fast because uh, we have optimized it on my server, but I. I think these two guys, price and uh, in watch list, is actually slow data. So I'm saying, actually server, just give me the name quickly and then send down the other data. So I'm deferring this part of my query. Let me format that. And then I'm executing that and you can see actually data is being patched in. I get the initial JSON graph and then data is being patched in. If you look in the transport um, log, we can see that what the server does, it, it, it sends actually first just this name graph down, and then it sends patches to my client, which says, okay, patch asset nodes, actually uh, this, this uh, data, patch that into this pass of my initial JSON graph. Let's have a look what that actually does when we put it in a real proper um, React application. Okay, so this is um, my React application actually for the service we have built so far. Um, and I have here under scenes a dashboard where I have my dashboard container and you can see here are actually the fragments. This is my GraphQL query. And here are fragments for my various components I'm using in this client. And I can see that the dashboard spotlight fragment is being deferred. And I can look into my, uh, into my dashboard spotlight um, component here and can see that there is um, here my dashboard spotlight card fragment, which is also being deferred, so I can stack defers uh, into each other. And let's have a look how that, that looks like when I start actually this application. So I'm... Ah, yeah, 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 I know. Sorry. Actually, I have no clue of React. Martin, my colleague, beneath this. Okay, that's um, starting. And then my application is coming up and you can see this component, this data was immediately there and then these other components came with um, and we used here suspense and stuff and um, 
so I immediately get my initial data, the ticker, the price, and the chart. And then when the other data is available, these components are being rendered. And that is making these uh, fluent applications even possible. That's why Facebook is using GraphQL in that way. Because when you go on their Facebook page and they load all the uh, news and the comments and the likes, they actually defer all this data. You get the first few stories immediately and then all these other data comes and it's a single HTTP connection that they are using. And the data is just being streamed over this single HTTP request. And that makes, even with very slow data, a very smooth um, uh, smooth data fetching possible. And look, my, my response time initially was 630 milliseconds for the first bytes to arrive and with defer only 37 milliseconds. Okay. That was a very quick little deep dive into GraphQL. Um, GraphQL is rapidly developing, so they, 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 it's adding new features in a rapid pace. GraphQL 21, uh, 2021 added a ton of features with GraphQL 2022, defer and stream is coming. Then we are talking about error boundaries. I had no time to show you these, um, but there's a lot of things in the pipeline of the GraphQL spec. And there are all things like one-off, like input unions and other things coming that make the type system stronger and give you more flexibility in building applications and building responsive applications with real-time data. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do. It's this my uh, Twitter handle. And uh, our library, Hot Chocolate, is available on GitHub. If you like it, help us, stars. If not, no worries. Um, uh, please uh, vote for the talk when you go out. I was asked by the NEC crew for that. If you have questions, I'm available. Anybody questions? No?